Welcome to Public Health On Call, a podcast from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, where we bring evidence, experience, and perspective to make sense of today's leading health challenges. If you have questions or ideas for us, please send an email to publichealthquestion at jhu.edu. That's publichealthquestion at jhu.edu for future podcast episodes. It's Lindsay Smith-Rogers. Today, the costs of displacing people experiencing homelessness. Dr. Joshua Baracus is an infectious disease physician at the University of Colorado School of Medicine, who studied what happens when homeless encampments are swept away. He talks to Dr. Josh Sharfstein about the consequences for health and the healthcare system and the implications for what we can do better. Let's listen. Dr. Joshua Barokas, thank you so much for joining me on Public Health On Call. You were one of the authors of this very interesting and important study about displacement of people who are experiencing homelessness. Could you explain what displacement is? Yeah, thanks for having me. So displacement can mean a lot of different things in a lot of different contexts, uh, and it looks different in cities across the U.S., Um, It can mean anything from move along orders. So someone is uh, set up on a sidewalk and they are asked to or forcibly moved uh, to a different sidewalk. It's sort of that old adage, you you don't have to go home, but you can't stay here. It can mean on sort of the other extreme that we come in with dump trucks, police uh, and quote unquote, clean up an encampment. So they will oftentimes um, in various cities come in in the middle of the night and um, literally tell people that they have to leave. uh, Otherwise, their belongings get thrown into the dump truck. So it's really a wide range of what can happen to people when they're unsheltered and living on the streets. And with the rise in the number of people in that condition, are we seeing more displacement? It varies by city. I know that um, here in Colorado, various jurisdictions, Denver and Aurora, which is predominantly where I I live and work, both have camping bans. And so um, as a result of the camping bans, there's a, a need for regular displacement or sweeps or involuntary uh, movements of people. Uh, By and large, we have seen increases in displacement over the last 10 years. And part of that comes from uh, increases in camping bans. It also comes from increases in public calls because there's so many more people who are unsheltered uh, over the last you know, half decade to decade, um, what we're actually seeing is more people are calling those 311 numbers, which is uh, what they will often do that triggers a, a sweep or a displacement. So we have seen increases across the country. So you don't have to go home, but you can't stay here. Now, now you're an infectious disease physician. Why have you gotten interested in studying displacement? So Uh, When I was in Boston, there were a series of what were called clean sweeps, clean sweep 1.0 and clean sweep 2.0 that occurred over the last, I think, six to seven years. Uh, What we saw was that when those sweeps would happen, people lost medication, oftentimes antibiotics or uh, medications for opioid use disorder like buprenorphine or methadone or naltrexone. Um, They also lost perhaps a supply of clean syringes or clean needles that they would have. Obviously, not everyone who is experiencing homelessness also has a substance use disorder, but there is quite a a lot of, of overlap. And so when people's belongings get tossed, Uh, or they're forced to move in a rushed sort of way for fear of imprisonment or or whatnot, they will oftentimes leave behind some of those, what I would consider critical components. But obviously, if you're trying to move really, really fast, 
you can't bring everything with you. So they will leave, let's say, a clean syringe, clean needle. That increases their chance of something like HIV, hepatitis C, or bacterial infection, like a skin infection. And so did you see the consequences of this in Boston? We did. And I now see it here in in Denver. Uh, This is something that's happening, like I said, across the country. But we saw hospitalizations. um, People were dispersed. And um, we would find unused needles, unused syringes, which led us to believe that um, what you're actually then doing is you may be having to share a needle because you left it behind. We did see over the last five to now eight years, increases in HIV incidents. There were outbreaks of HIV, outbreaks of hepatitis C that sort of ran concurrent with not just the increases in uh, homelessness, but increases in unsheltered homelessness and the sweeps that were occurring. So you're seeing cases of people getting sick because they're displaced. You're also seeing outbreaks And now you went ahead with a group of colleagues and used some public health tools to look at this at a broader scale. Can you explain this research? We did what's called simulation modeling. Um, The best way that I can explain this is if anybody ever played that game SimCity when they were a kid or or The Sims um, for people who might be a, a little bit younger than me, we create a population using computer code and essentially put in data that makes the population look like a population that might be in existence. So in our case, we had a model of injection drug use and healthcare utilization. That was the computer code that sort of backed up the entire model. And we were able to use data from 23 different cities to create cohorts of people who were experiencing homelessness who injected drugs and then run them through the simulation in this sort of fake life over the next 10 years, what would happen if they were displaced on sort of a continual basis? What would happen if we didn't displace them? And what did you find? So importantly, like I said earlier, we modeled populations of people who inject drugs. I want to be really, really clear. These are overlapping epidemics, but it does not mean that every person with a substance use disorder is experiencing homelessness and not every person experiencing homelessness has a substance use disorder. What we have seen nationally, obviously, is a rise in both, and uh, they're oftentimes interrelated. When we project the impact of sweeps over or displacement over a 10-year period across these 23 cities. We found increases in non-fatal and fatal overdose. We found increases in hospitalization. We found decreases in initiations of medications for opioid use disorder. And we found decreases in life expectancy. We found overall that sweeps, displacement in this population could account for up to about 25% increases in death in this population by 2028. One thing that I think is really important is that we found increases in hospitalization. And one of the things that has come about from this study is we live in a world that exists in an overburdened healthcare system that got burned out doctors, burned out nurses, we're having a hard time recruiting. And if you've been to a hospital recently, there are long wait times, regardless of whether you have a house or don't have a house. When we do these sweeps, when we increase displacement, it increases the chance that this population is going to have to use the hospital. This has implications for both that population and people like you and me who have to use the hospital for various things. I might have a heart attack one of these days. I might need a knee replacement. The fact of the matter is, is that this is affecting all of us, even if we don't think that it necessarily does. 
And the last time I checked, um, hospitalizations weren't particularly inexpensive. Hospitalizations are not inexpensive, and nor is the cost of the actual displacement. So as we're trying to come up with rational approaches to homelessness and to substance use, you know, it's something that I've learned actually from you, which is we should be investing in things that work and not investing in things that don't work. It turns out that if we are displacing people without services, uh, without the possibility of getting into housing, and we're just forcing people to move along, that's costing money, direct dollars. Our city pays for those sweeps. We pay for the garbage trucks. We pay for the, the police officers. We pay for the Department of Transportation, who oftentimes runs the displacement. On top of that, there are downstream costs to our society that I think we forget about the cost of hospitalization, the cost of emergency room utilization. It's a compounded cost. So you have this scenario essentially where people are asking to remove encampments. They want it out of sight, but there are all these downstream consequences for life, for finances and for just the overall stress that we all are experiencing these days in our intersection, for example, with the healthcare system. Yeah. And I'll say, I think that one of the reasonable and, and obvious questions that come up is, well, what should we be doing? We don't have a magic bullet where everyone right away could be housed various candidates in mayoral races or governor's races will say we can put up tiny homes we can do sanction encampments we can build more houses the fact of the matter is is it's not just let's get people into a home because we don't have that infrastructure i think that what our study showed and what i i want people to think about is we showed the worst case scenario we said we should not be displacing people without services. Services can look different, but we know that doing this, which is what we do in Denver, 4% of people in Denver who experience displacement get services, 4%. So we can effectively say that you know nobody's getting services, they get, they get moved. So we know that this isn't the right thing to do, and we know that we want desperately to get people into housing. We all want the same thing. We want to end homelessness. While we are figuring that out, while we are coming up with both transitional and long-term stable housing options, we cannot continue to do this without services. And I ask the question as well, why, if it's all about health and safety and public health and public safety, this shows that this public is being harmed by this approach. And, and I think that that's recentering on who the public is and the public health. And this question is really important. The last thing that I'll say on this sort of diatribe of mine is some of the comments that we've received about this study have to do with, well, it can't be healthy to stay in an encampment where there's human feces, where there's discarded needles, we have to move these people. My question is, why do we have to move the people? Why can't we bring services to people to make it, in the interim, a healthier living environment? Why can't we bring toilets and showers? Why can't we have trash removal on a regular basis? All of this would improve both public's health, both the unhoused and the housed public. Right. Well, I think your study really quantifies the, I want to use the word insanity of the approach that we take, where we hope that by moving people that the problem is going to get solved. And in fact, it circles back in many different ways, horrible for the people who are moved and and uh, very expensive and terrible in, in ways more generally. And um, I wonder, since it's been a little while since the study has come out, whether you think it is starting to open conversations or even change minds? I do, and I'm grateful for that. Because 
that was the point of doing this, uh, this entire exercise with the CDC, with the National uh, Healthcare for the Homeless Council, and with collaborators across the country, really. The goal was to start the conversation, to quantify, as you said, that this is actually causing harm to people. And our cities and our state governments, we're not supposed to be causing harm. We're really supposed to be helping people. And we're supposed to be helping, in my opinion, the most vulnerableized people. Uh, and I use the word vulnerableized because we are vulnerabilizing them. We are making them more vulnerable by these interventions, uh, these displacements. Right, you're taking away their medicines. Their IDs. Right. <laughs> They're losing things that they may be using to help themselves in different ways. It's putting them in a much worse position. And you think people are starting to grapple with that? You know, I do. I've had a number of city councils or people who are part of city governments reach out to talk about, well, what does this mean for my city? What's the best way to have this conversation? Because for some reason, homelessness has become a lightning rod. It's almost that people go to one side or the other. And I think it's important that we look at this from a humanitarian perspective and say, these are human beings. These are people who are in our communities. And it shouldn't be as vitriolic as it is right now. And so having this discussion, um, framing it in a very Josh Sharfstein sort of way of we should be doing things that work and not doing things that don't work. This is one of those things that just doesn't work. And when we take it off the table, we can actually start to see, well, what could we do to replace it? What could we do instead of this? And we've been having those conversations with various city officials. And I, I really enjoy those conversations because it's really research to, to action, research to impact. And I hear you. I think partly what you're saying is we need to have a toolkit that every step is in the right direction. And eventually you're getting to housing and in some cases maybe you're getting to housing quickly and that is the goal but even if you're not you're making people safer you're not making people less safe and jeopardizing so many other important priorities well dr Barocas, thank you so much for explaining this great research thank you for all your work thank you i appreciate it public health on call is a podcast from the johns hopkins bloomberg school of public health produced by joshua sharfstein Lindsay Smith Rogers and Stephanie Desmond. Audio production by JB Arbogast, Holly Cardinal, Philip Porter, Spencer Greer, and Matthew Martin, with support from Chip Hickey. Distribution by Nick Moran. Production support from Catherine Ricardo. Social media run by Grace Fernandez and Shian Briscoe. If you have questions or ideas for us, please send an email to publichealthquestion at jhu.edu. That's publichealthquestion at jhu.edu for future podcast episodes. Thank you for listening.